Uh, all right. So I heard a little bit of uh, chat when we were all assembling, when there were only 20 people in the chat and Phil was talking that uh, this crisis we're in, the health slash economic crisis of coronavirus is going to involve a lot of changes to how we do things. Uh, a lot of money being spent or given away in new ways that we haven't been, haven't been done before. And, and I think, you know, with a crisis is opportunity to do new and good things that would have never happened in normal times, but it's still a time to be wary and, and not really let anything slide just because um, something has to be done. And so I think with that in mind, uh, for those who haven't read Game of Mates, that's uh, a book I wrote with Paul Friders about grey corruption, how the game's played, how much it costs and what to do about it. It's about political favouritism in Australia. And, um, and I think some of the ideas in there are worth keeping in mind um, in normal times and now. And um, so I guess the way I think about it, um, I, I'm going to start with political favoritism because um, you know, regardless of what we do, regardless of how we spend, regardless of um, what gets priority, uh, the policy changes are going to come through a filter. So if you can imagine there's a, a sea of ideas out in the public, in people's minds being talked about in the media, uh, the political process is about filtering those through and, and picking some to implement. Uh, and that process, uh, you know, is still infiltrated and run by people with certain uh, political and financial interests. So we need to be keenly aware of, of when and how um, they are getting their way and when and how they might be incentivized to do what's in the general interest because this is an unusual situation. So let me just give you a bit of a framework for how I think about favoritism because it might, um, it might be useful for when we discuss policy implementation and persuasion uh, of pol pol policy makers, even in this crisis environment. So the way I see um, political favoritism on playing uh, is that there are four key elements to getting a favor. And firstly, you need a gray gift. You need to be a decision maker who can give something to someone uh, that doesn't cost them personally and that provides a large private benefit. Uh, and I call that a grey gift. So when you rezone land for additional density, you're essentially giving property rights for free to someone who happens to own this piece of land and you're not charging and it didn't cost you personally anything. And that person can then go and sell those rights in the private market and just capitalise on them. Um, when you offer... Um, you know, guarantees to loans or when you privatise uh, uh, a road but then underwrite that with a public promise, that has a value. That promise has a value. Uh, so these are all types of grey gifts that can be given away. Uh, and that, you know, that's a good sort of way of thinking because in this sort of crisis period, we actually want to give away some things for free to certain people, we have to make that decision uh, somehow. In the normal course of you know, pol policy processes, we typically, we typically don't. We typically want the private sector to take their own risks and uh, we want the public sector to um, purchase uh, from the private sector and not just give them money for nothing. So we, we have to be keenly aware that um, what we're doing in a crisis is, is not dissimilar to what we do day to day, but the uh, scope um, to give away things for free because it's an emergency might be a little bit stronger, even if the scope for doing things that are in the public interest is a bit stronger. So to, to, to um, add the next ingredient of, of political favoritism, we have this great gift, but we also need a group. We also need someone to favor who's going to reciprocate the favor in the future. And that helps us understand, um, helps us identify when something is a grey gift or and when it's not, is it being given to someone who is likely to reciprocate? Is it a relative? Is it someone with former business relations? Um, is it the type of industry that might employ you after politics? Um, you need to have a group that 
um, can look after you and repay you, even if not directly, indirectly. So how do you know who can favor you? Well, the third ingredient is a signal. People need to be able to differentiate who's in the group and who's out of the group. Who can I trust if I favor you will favor me in the future? How do I know you're in the in group or you're someone who's going to dob us in? This is a problem that the mafia and organized criminal gangs face. Who, who can I trust? Because, you know, the FBI might be trying to infiltrate me. I need good signals to differentiate someone I can trust who's going to look after me and someone who might dob me in. And so you see things like political donations, um, burning money, I call it, um, to show that you're interested in playing the game. Um, you send your kids to the right schools, you attend the right golf clubs, uh, all those sorts of things in, in sort of ingratiate you in, and, and allow other people to measure where you are in the group. Um, so it's, you know, I call, I call political donations the facial tattoos of the political mafia um, because they're a signal. They're telling you, I want to be in the tribe. I'm committed to repaying a favor. And the last important ingredient, which is, um, which is quite amazing right now. Um, <laughs> it's quite amazing because we're seeing behind the curtain uh, in this crisis period is you need myths, you need stories to cover your tracks so that um, when you do favor your mates and you're giving these gray gifts, you're handing economic value from the public to selected mates, uh, that you can pretend that it's in the public interest. Oh, if I don't rezone this housing developer, oh, there'll be no housing supply. Okay, that's a good story. I mean, you don't have to do it for free. You could sell it, but it's a good story. Um, oh, we need, um, got to keep costs down or there'll be a shortage of, of this or that thing. Um, you know, uh, regulation, red tape is, is, is stifling competition. You pick a story. You need a story to cover your tracks. One of the biggest myths and something this group is obviously very interested in is the budget. You've got to think about the government budget as a story. It's a work of fiction that is produced to sell politics. It's essentially a, uh, you know, we should have the budget on Gruen transfer, you know, the TV show that scrutinizes advertising and get those guys to see, wow, isn't this amazing? We, we craft this political document and the media amplifies it and it's all meaningless nonsense. We can record, you know, we can pick any accounting standards we want to change the budget any way we want and we do it for political reasons. So we've got these um, ingredients to political favoritism. We've got the gray gift, giving something of private value from the public for free because of your position of power or your uh, institutional power. You've got a group who you can give to knowing that someone in that group, if not directly, but indirectly will repay the favor in the future. So you have this credit system going within the group. You have signals, donations, attending the right events, being in the right clubs, living in the right areas, driving the right cars, wearing the right suit, eating at the right restaurants, working for the right consulting firms, you name it. These are all ways to signal to others that you are in the in group and not the out group. You can definitely imagine, um, you know, showing up uh, with dreadlocks to some kind of political meeting. Uh, well, that's a real signal. You're not, you don't look like the in group. And the last ingredient is the myths and of which the budget is one, but every sort of industry has its own story. So I think these are thing, good things to keep in mind not only in normal times, but in a, a crisis period. And as I said, we've got this sea of policy ideas that circulate in the community, in universities, in think tanks, in, in government departments, uh, in the media. And typically the filtration process that sucks up policies into, um, uh, into uh, legislation is, is run by these groups who pick and choose what suits them. And they put stories out put the myths out that circulate around and they filter it up. But the crisis is actually a really good time because in many ways, it's much harder to repeat the myth when everyone sort of knew it wasn't really true. 
So in my area in housing, people often say, if you don't rezone land, no one's going to build houses. You know, zoning's crushing housing supply. Well, it's highly likely that this year, new housing supply is going to fall off a cliff, that many property developers will go bust, um, pre-sales will collapse, uh, there'll be fire sales of half-built developments of housing. And yet, there's almost nobody saying, oh, well, we could solve everything by rezoning. We could resurrect and, and double the housing construction sector. And they, they do this because they know actually in reality, it wasn't really rezoning. We just said that because that's a nice, great gift we like. We actually know in reality to employ construction workers, you have to buy houses and order them. Essentially, you have to go and order them to be built. Like if you wanted to buy a ship, you have to literally go and order it um, with pre-sales. So there is an opportunity in many areas to, um, to, to streamline and, and essentially skirt past these vested interests to policymakers, staffers, their advisors uh, with good hard policy ideas. So how have I been involved in that? Um, in a, in a couple of ways. So housing and urban development are my big areas these days, uh, as well as keeping an eye on dodgy politics and vested interests in general. And I've really had um, two ideas uh, injected into this uh, debate. Uh, the first one concerns commercial rents. And I've got other ideas for residential rents. Uh, one of the big issues these days is that businesses that have been forced to close for weeks and maybe months um, have variable costs that they can shift so their casual workers can they can stop paying them because they don't have to roster them on but they have fi fixed costs and one of them is rent and uh, it's a bit of a problem paying your rent uh, when your revenues collapse to zero so what what we really want to do is we want to support the uh, continuity of business relationships in the economy through this crisis. One of the problems in a recession is when businesses start to go broke, their suppliers no longer have someone, so they start doing something different or they go broke and their customers start having to do other things and stock their retail stores with different products or move into other areas. You break all these links in the chain and the more links you break and the quicker, the longer and more costly it is to reorganize production in the economy. You will have cranes that have been uh, were up to build high rise buildings, offices and, and apartments, and they will sit for years in yards unused because it takes a long time to reorganize, um, add, get, get the confidence back for people to purchase them, but literally reorganize the economy so that we can use the resources we have once again. So the continuity of business is important. And so if you can make fixed costs that they have variable, so if you can take rent that's a fixed lump that they have to pay and make it variable as well, just like wages can be variable uh, for casuals and by, um, by firing people, then you can uh, help the continuity uh, through this short-term shock. So my, well, you can do a couple of things. One, you can just pay the rent for people, just like we're paying some wages. But it's even better to leverage any subsidy you provide. And so my proposal is to leverage a subsidy by um, covering 30 to 40 cents in the dollar that a commercial landlord discounts the rent. So if a commercial landlord takes their lease uh, amends the contract and submits that to whatever the statutory authority that's going to run this system will be. And they reduce the rent um, $20,000 for the rest of the year, then the government will pay um, six or $8,000 to them for that. So they will share the loss, the landlord, the government leverages their six or $8,000 to be a $20,000 cash flow subsidy to the business. So we, we share the hit more evenly amongst businesses and landlords, and we leverage the subsidy that we're using. So I think there's a, a lot of elements of fairness there. We're not giving stuff away for free. We, what we don't wanna do is give businesses cash and they try and hold on. And essentially they just pay the rent for a few months 
but don't pay any of their staff and then they go broke. So what you're doing is you're subsidizing the landlord for their risks. And you know, I guess we see it, you know, economic theory would say that well, ra rational landlords would see that they risk huge amounts of vacancy next year in, in particular retail areas, in tourism areas, um, the universities, uh, uh, you know, any industry related to tourism, uh, education, travel, uh, various um, you know, international travel, airlines, hotels, they, you know, they're going to be not in good shape for a long time. Even if things return to normal quickly, the fear of you know, international travel is, is not going to be the same for a long time because of border controls. Um, so in these areas, you'd think landlords would predict, well, I don't want to have vacancies for many years. I will negotiate voluntarily. So what you, what, you know, my proposal is to leverage this um, information that landlords in this sector and tenants in this sector have. They, you know, they're trying to come to an agreement, but what you do is you inject money to leverage what was likely to happen anyway. And then hopefully um, for a lot of businesses, you get them through this and a lot of uh, areas reliant on tourism, whatever, you actually keep shops open on their main street uh, on the other side. So that's, you know, that's an idea. Um, it's interesting in this space right now because the property council wants direct subsidies to landlords, but that's the interesting thing because, you know, I've been talking about these business relationships that are important to maintain through the crisis. So you can come out the other side and businesses, they know who can supply what and they can rebuild, um, you know, their production. Landlords are a little bit different because they're a little bit like asset owners or shareholders. Um, it doesn't really matter if they go broke because they don't really have these um, important production links. Uh, if I own a shopping center, I can send myself broke making stupid investments and uh, the administrators will come in <laughs> and they will sell my assets to somebody else. And I'll, you know, I'll take a big loss, right? I'll be out of there. I'll lose my assets. But the tenants and the production activity that's going on will almost not really notice if it's well managed in many cases. Um, the buildings will still be full with the same ten tenants producing the same goods and services. So, you know, there, if we're thinking about um, who we want to protect, where subsidies should go, we're going to be giving away grey gifts, but we want to target them in a way that's productive. So landlords are way, way down the list of people who should be getting subsidies to tide them through and maintain productive capacity. Their buildings can't go anywhere. It's their tenants that we care about. So that's, um, uh, that's the commercial subsidy. For residential areas, I don't know if you've followed on social media. I know many people personally, landlords and tenants, uh, who've lost their jobs or they've been stood down, who've you know, had months of no income ahead and um, very unlikely or uh, very low expectations of pay rises, promotions, or even jobs on the other side, asking for rental discounts. And you know, we have the same sort of issue. Landlords want to be protected. Uh, in, in the residential market, you know, I'm, I'll put the idea out there. Maybe I, haven't, I, haven't, um, I haven't written it out anywhere, but we have a huge stock of rental bonds that are typically four weeks rent. And what we can do is, for example, do the same sort of leverage and allow these rental bonds to be used to pay the rent conditional on some kind of rental holiday. And then the government can just offer insurance to landlords up to that amount. So you can substitute the cash sitting there with a, just a promise, an insurance promise by the public. And what that sort of does is it takes it off book. You can't say it's a budgetary problem because it wasn't public spending. It was using their own bonds. We would, in, we would record the insurance uh, separately in the budget. We wouldn't probably account for it as a cash expenditure. And, and you could do it that way. You could, you could take advantage of, of these funds that are sitting there and substitute cash for uh, an insurance promise. And, and that would be quite useful if we wanted to do that. And again, what we want to do is we don't want to force people to move multiple times because of temporary shocks, right? If you're in a house 
you're planning to stay there long term. We don't want you to have to move once, move twice, perhaps find somewhere else. All those costs, if you have tens or hundreds of thousands of households moving multiple times in the next 12 or 18 months unnecessarily, um, you know, it's great for movers and stuff, but it's actually not that, um, you know, it's not providing great utility or welfare um, for everybody involved. So there's a couple of ideas. The other idea in this crisis, and I might stop um, soon and we can have a bit of discussion. Uh, in, in, so my other idea in the housing sector is to deal with the construction, housing construction industry. And this is a big macro picture issue. We have a housing construction sector that employs around 7% of the labor force, is around 5% of GDP, and it was already falling dramatically last year. Apartment construction, house construction was always already falling off these peaks. And, uh, you know, the, the turnover is very low, not much is selling. And I don't think we're going to have a really strong spring selling season this year. So it's likely that you know, quite a lot of um, approved and ready to go housing is just going to sit there for years. Um, you know, the owners of those lots are going to be dealing with financial issues, trying to borrow extra money, trying to do build to rent if they have deep pockets and they can just um, get it built and keep it on their balance sheet. But what we can do is we want to maintain the capacity of the construction sector. We want those cranes that we've built and have been used to keep being used rather than sit idle for years. We want those trucks that deliver material. We don't want them parked up for years. We want to use them to do something useful. And so what you want to do is have, a, you know, again, my proposal here is to leverage the sites that are already through the planning process that already have engineers working on them, builders working out how to build it and design it, that are already doing pre-sales. And as a public entity, whatever entity we choose, you can submit, um, uh, you would request tenders from developers and landowners to supply you new housing. So if I have a site, I'm going to build 50 apartments and I can't seem to offload it. And uh, I've, I've got a, I've gotten leveraged into this. I've got five pre-sales, but you know, it, that took me a year to get, I might decide I need to get rid of that asset. So what I do is I submit a tender to the government and say, I will complete this. I will, if you can pay me this, that's enough money to pay the construction and get this to the end. And I will submit a tender for half a million dollars per apartment for 50 apartments in here. And other developers in this city will also submit. We hire a bunch of um, tough negotiators, not from the housing development sector, but from another sector, maybe oil or gas or mining, maybe from a different state, someone who can review the tenders, has the construction and engineering knowledge, understands the contracts, is familiar with the types of companies involved and, and how to hold people to account, make sure they deliver what they pay for. And you get them to run this tender process. I call this idea the housing, uh, the central housing bank, because what our central bank does is it offers, it's a sort of lender of last resort, okay? It buys assets off the financial markets that set prices to manage the interest rate, the price of money. This central housing can bank can buy distressed assets uh, from home builders and developers to uh, stop that flood of housing coming on the market, but also get it built and increase the supply, ensure that those 7% of people who work in housing construction can keep building houses. And that housing bank can hold these um, houses on their books. They can rent them out through local agents. They can give them to social housing providers. They can give them to public housing and they can be like any other landlord. So they have this, in a crisis when things collapse, they go and they purchase it and they stabilize the construction sector. The beautiful thing about it is like a central bank, if houses prices start rising again, you can have a trigger. So if prices rise more than 5% in a year, that can trigger selling from the central housing bank into the private market to depress prices. So what you're doing is exactly like a central bank. You've got this corridor 
um, system where when prices are falling and everyone's in trouble, you buy lots of houses. Prices are rising, you sell lots of houses. And it stabilizes the construction industry, keeps people employed. You know, the central bank does this also sometimes for currency. Even though we have a free floating exchange rate, it's not that free. Uh, in the financial crisis, when it dropped to 60 cents, the central bank used its US dollars to buy Aussie dollars and keep the price up and accumulate those assets. When the price went back up, it sold them back into the market and it made billions. It made billions in profit from these counter cyclical trades in, uh, in the uh, currency markets during the crisis and, and they gave them to the treasury. Like that was revenue for the government. So I think, you know, if we can think about things we already do, uh, that helps with the sales pitch. And I think in general, injecting more public oversight in the housing market is a good idea. It breaks that mental barrier. And I've spoken to politicians of both sides, Labor and Liberal, who've said, oh, well, you know, the public just doesn't build houses anymore. I know it's a good idea, but we just can't say that. Quite literally, Labor housing spokesman has told me that. Uh, but if we can say, hey, well, you know, it's actually not that different to what the central bank does and they do a really good job of stabilising financial markets. Aren't you interested in stabilising the housing market? Seems like a good sell. Uh, and then you have this more active involvement. And then when we get back to normal times, people can say, you know, um, there's a housing shortage. Well, we've got this great central housing bank. You know, it can supply housing whenever it wants. And if prices rise too much, it can sell them back to the private market. It can help stabilise that. So I think there's a few win-wins there. And I think if we, you know, if we put our thinking hats on and we, you know, we're aware of how the political process is, is captured in many ways, how uh, we don't want to be giving away grey gifts willy-nilly. What we want to do is leverage subsidies that we give, we want to get something in return. We want to buy houses if we want to subsidize the housing construction sector, for example. We want to leverage what we put in there and we want to you know, support the uh, productive sectors with those productive relationships more than the asset owners. Um, we don't want to you know, keep share prices up. We don't want to bail out shopping center owners. We really want to uh, support those productive sectors. Uh, and in doing so, what we can do is use this crisis opportunity to undermine the myths that have previously been used. It's not going to last forever, but it might you know, force various um, interest groups to come up with better stories in the future if we can uh, um, prove how foolish or, or wrong they were right now. So that's what I'm, I'm up to lately. Um, I'm injecting my ideas of the Central Housing Bank commercial rent subsidy and leveraging um, uh, residential bonds uh, into the into the mix as ways we can uh, smooth this crisis period without giving away too many grey gifts and leveraging whatever we do give away uh, to focus on those economic relationships. So I'd yeah you know, I'd love to um, have a chat with everyone now and if you have any questions about my views on where to from here, how things might unwind. Uh, which sectors are more important than others and what the budget's going to look like next year. I think we should have a, a chat about that. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was um, so eye-opening. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, which I spotted. Uh, looks like Stephen's jumped on. Hello, Stephen. Nice to see you. Um, I might just go, I've been dealing with some people's tech support requests. I think a couple of people are struggling with the addition of a password and couldn't get into the meeting. So I had my attention was in and out a little bit, um, but. Um, I, I can see all these texts. I'll, I'll just go through yeah. some of them. Eh? Do you uh, want to, Scott, you want to hi Scott, them? how's yeah. it going? <laughs> I can, uh, so you, you've written here that, uh, Commercial rents, commercial property values are based on a, a, a ratio of rents. So if you lower your rent, uh, it lowers the property value. So you actually take a cash flow hit and a balance sheet hit uh, if you have to mark that to market. And that's why uh, landlords don't want to do that. 
Yeah, exactly. And this is, this is quite interesting because we were already rolling over a peak in commercial areas. So you see shop fronts, every second shop is for lease and yet rents are foolishly high. Well, that's a bizarre situation. Like economics doesn't have a, a story for that until you put the balance sheet in there and go, well, actually, if they drop the rent, they have to mark down the value of their property and all the other tenants when they renew will see that. So it's better to delay as long as you can realizing, you know, the true value of, of the, the rent. And so, yes, that's, that's a huge problem now. And I think, you know, that's one reason landlords are very worried about negotiating down rents. But I think if what you can do is, is give them a fixed window that, that back end final point. So if you say um, we sub we'll subsidize 30% of a rent discount for the rest of the calendar year, um, then you give them that window, they can keep the, the long term lease price up here and they can take this short term value and then they can just subtract that discounted value off their value off their capital value. So it sort of gives them an excuse not to mark down the capital value so much. Does that make sense to you, Scott? Yeah. Hello, Cameron. Nice to see you again. And um, I hope uh, if you see Julian at all these days, I hope he's well. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thanks. Excellent. Um, yeah, I would agree with pretty much everything you've said, for, I think, for the reasons we both know. Um, and we, I think we both agree from experience and study that there is a huge amount of fiction in this area. And um, the example I gave on the commercial property rents was that I think <laughs> even amongst the regulators, there's a lot of collusion on that one because back to the last great recession we had in 89 to 92, the collapse of commercial property values is one of the main causes of the bankruptcy of both the, I think it's the South Australian and Victorian state banks. And ever since then, even some treasury officials I've met and worked with have been terrified of that happening again. So I think they actually quite, even though they know it's rubbish economically, they quietly go along with the commercial property values because they don't want to be the treasury official in charge of a collapsed bank. But, you know, sometimes it, it does so much damage to the, rest of the economy so many other businesses are paying unrealistic <laughs> rent that they can't survive on that it, it just finishes up putting a lot of people out of jobs. And so at some point they've just got to realize that's just lousy policy. But I agree with your other ideas. Yeah, that's yeah no, uh, you're definitely right. This is, this is not dealing with one layer because behind those commercial landlords, there are banks and other um, layers of interest in that asset. So uh, yeah, I, I can see yeah, that you, yeah, the regulatory capture runs deep in supporting those prices. Um, that's, that's true, but uh, look, I think if you can do things in small bites and get the fixed time period thing going, then you know, those banks with long-term mortgages and you know, the, the, the average lease expire will be very long on most um, uh, leases. You, know, you can kind of get away with it. I would hope you're more likely to. Uh, Stephen, don't you have tenants in those newly built public properties? Stephen, do you mean uh, if the Central Housing Bank buys these newly built houses and then when the price rises, we sell them off again? Are you still there? I do. I don't see any reason to sell them off again. Uh, there's not enough public housing. So when there was a downturn, I'd stabilise the construction industry, but I'd have them building public housing. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. The federal government doing uh, funding that, not the state governments who lack the financial resources to do. Yeah, I definitely think the federal government should fund this, and uh, there should be a national housing bank. Um, the selling off, I think, you know, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone here. In housing, you know, it's nice to have a mechanism to dampen demand in a boom. And even the promise of selling off housing uh, will reduce expectations of people, you know, clambering into property. Uh, you don't have to sell the ones that you have. You can commission new ones and sell them at a faster rate than what the private developers would do. Um, so you can definitely accelerate the supply, um, but I think it's worth having the option there. And you're right that these would have tenants in them. So, you know, if you didn't in a boom time, you know, get new supply and, and just literally sell it on, you would have to wait for tenants to leave. If you didn't want to just entrench the disposability of tenants, you could set an example that, well, when a tenant voluntarily leaves, those ones will hit the market. Um, that's a good idea. 
I keep you. Yeah. Uh, very interesting ideas. Thanks. <laughs> can I, can yeah. I just offer um, the chance for people who haven't been able to type in the chat? Maybe they're on their phones or for some other reason, but have a burning question. Either wave your hand at me frantically, and I will run through the. Ah, uh, I see Jane. Jane, would you like to um, say something? Yeah, thanks, Gabby. Um, for Cameron, I, it's a very um, personal <laughs> interest. Um, I'm a local government councillor, and we're getting pressure from a few of the councillors to waive commercial rates for the next quarter to help our businesses. Uh, apparently, the land the shop owners pass the commercial rates across to the tenant which i didn't realize that because i just thought they click the, the, they wouldn't pay their rates and then they still um do the, the rent do you think there's any merit in waiving commercial rates for six months i mean the ceo's thing is to is actually invest into infrastructure like our, we're looking at a new library um but yeah you know, there's this other push to actually um decrease our income by waiving rates yeah so you can do that temporarily uh, so because the leases will be longer than the rate holiday, you can't use that rate holiday as an excuse to capitalize that into your next lease price, if you know what I mean. So the, you, if you do it temporarily, you can do that and you can make it conditional on it being, uh, you know, the tenant who's paying. And that's another way to uh, reduce cash flows temporarily or cash outflows. Uh, of productive businesses. So um, that's a good idea. Have a fixed period. Uh, <laughs> that's important and make sure it's uh, only for um, businesses who uh, are obliged to pay that in their lease. Oh, I see. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah, good idea. Can I just say something? Can I just say something? It's Phil. Phil. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't believe, I don't believe the state and local government should be, should be, uh, um, so, uh, wearing a lot of this cost. I mean, it should be it should be uh, borne by the federal government, which is the currency issuer. The councils and the state governments aren't in the financial fiscal position that the federal government's in. Uh, yeah, I I agree, but I uh, I would expect, uh, given you know the crisis period, that there are going to be extraordinary grants and uh, allocations down the government hierarchy. Um, I'm not suggesting, that, I'm not suggesting that local government shouldn't be doing it. It's just that if they do it, the federal government should be picking up the tab. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's that's a smart thing in general um, because, you know, it's, it's a classic problem in our government governance structure in general is that states have to spend all the education and health money. Federal government gets all this revenue and, um, and there's political negotiation to, to deliver services um, when the states do have, uh, you know, stricter but still somewhat soft budgets. <laughs> um, they definitely don't have the capacity of the federal government. Um, yeah, and I think in general, uh, federal governments could, um, you know, they can allocate uh, extraordinary grants for these types of things. Stop, I don't think that's what students do. Okay, then it must be clear. Yeah, correct. So some recommendations from Scott and Tim that you've got to be wary in the details um, that the whatever you subsidize gets to the entity that you're trying to uh, preserve. <laughs> you um, make sure it's in writing that the tenants um, not paying the rates if they're waived. It's good. Any other questions? I can't see any hands. There's three pages of people here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking as well. Uh, wave at me. Uh, Paul Willey. <clears throat> oh. Can't hear you, still, Paul. You're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Historically, increased subsidies have led to increased prices. I mean, when in 1984-5, the federal government shifted from investment in public housing to rent assistance, private rents went through the roof. The same things happened with the NDIS, you know, prices by providers. So 
your government's into the market with large swathes of subsidy, most of those get consumed in, you know, higher prices. So I'd be interested in your thoughts mm -hmm. about how to mitigate against that. The other thing too, if I could, the Central Housing Bank, I would be interested to understand more how it would help with affordability and security and access. I know it's an admirable goal to want to stabilise the housing market, although the studies we did 20 odd years ago indicated that buying purchased housing generates almost as much income as buying um, as building new housing. It's just in different different employment sectors and different markets. But and so while you know stabilising and keeping the housing construction industry going is admirable, how does a central housing bank help with affordability and security and access that, that wouldn't be better served by investment in public housing? Yeah. Uh, well, it's actually public housing by stealth. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you do use it essentially to invest in public housing, but you, you, you change the story um, to say, well, yeah, the governments don't do public housing anymore. Yeah, you're right. I'm not going to make you rethink the story that you believe, but you know we do um, we do stabilise financial markets, and housing is sort of a financial market, and it has a big employment base associated with it. So in a way, it's a it's a Trojan horse for public housing, <laughs> and I think you know, my my long the long term idea is that having a public housing um, authority involved with actually building lots of housing all the time. And having expertise in this um, will allow you to set the agenda for uh, lease standards and long-term tenants. And you can you can have some that are just privately rented at, at market, but they can be extra secure. You could have lifetime leases. You know, it, it allows you to start experimenting and, and improving uh, on other fronts. Um, when you want to improve minimum standards, you go, well, if we can do it, you can do it. We've already done it with our new housing. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. On, on the subsidies go, getting capitalised into, um, was that your question? Housing. Yeah. Um, so I think the trick is, for example, with, uh, you know, land tax holidays or something like that, um, if you just keep it for a very fixed period, then you, um, you can avoid that, um, that next round negotiation of it getting capitalised into prices. You're sort of sneaking it in between the opportunities for prices to be renegotiated. So there's, uh, that, that's sort of how I would see um, subsidies in general working in a crisis period is that you, you fix them. Uh, there's six months or, or this. And so uh, you can't really um, capitalise that in, on an ongoing basis. Uh, you know, I, I'm very aware of your your issue of um, offering open-ended subsidies that just go to asset owners. Um, I'm also very wary, for example, of um, you know, corporate bailouts and, and essentially cash gifts to what we decide are national important industries like airlines. Uh, and I'm definitely a fan of taking ownership for any cash injected into the business. Uh, and I, I think that seems completely fair. If it's nationally important to get a bailout, then it's maybe it's so important we should own some of it. Um, you can definitely dilute the current shareholders drastically. Um, and I think uh, I've mentioned a standing facility for sharing equity uh, with the government. If a, if a company really um, needs cash, you know, we don't want to give it for nothing. We want to take ownership. We'll take the upside as well. It's one of the things in drought policy that's always um, bothered me is we, we sort of either lend money or give cash grants, but we don't get anything back. And I mean, droughts are predictable and we want people to manage the risks themselves rather than uh, you know, uh, essentially capitalise the value of future subsidies into their land. So we should maybe take some equity stakes um, or liens on the property. So when the property is sold, we get some of our money back. Um, and that's just just my general principle of getting something. Don't give something for nothing. Don't just give grey gifts. Um, make sure you're getting something in return that is of economic consequence. Can I just say really quickly with regard as the final point that 
the kind of housing system that you described in your first the first part of your response, Cameron, is not far off what we actually had in South Australia under the South Australian Housing Trust. And, you know, we increased the stock by 50% with a huge construction force uh, workforce between 1980, 1980 and 1990. We were up to 12.5% of the, the rental housing stock, so people could choose to come to public rent if private rent were too high. We had a Housing Improvement and Rent Control Act. We provided rent relief and bond subsidies, and we had a public lender to low income people to get into home ownership. It was a, and we controlled the land supply through the Urban Land Trust and Lands Banking. So it's really only back to the future of about 20 years ago to read for me. <laughs> yeah, well, and in fact, in Singapore, it's still like that. And in yeah. most states, uh, there were two, you know, 15 or 20 year periods where it was like that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, those are the periods where housing costs came way down, home ownership went up. Um, they, you know, they were the housing boom times, essentially the opposite of what's happened the last 20 years of declining ownership, rising prices and unaffordability. So, right. yeah, I, I, yeah, it's not, it, it did come from reading up on, on these cases, but I, you know, I'm not specifically familiar with the South Australian case, but it sounds uh, like a common, common example. Yeah. Could, could we, um, could I say, uh, I've had a request uh, from Tim Whiffen, who's been waiting quite a while for a question. Um, he doesn't have a webcam, so unfortunately we can't see him. Um, and yep. then I've got Tim Matthews as well. And then we might have to leave it there for questions because we've come to probably come to the end of the hour by that time. If that's okay. Uh, uh, Tim, yeah, go Tim. Have you written it or have you? No, no. You, so I just thought I would speak it just because oh, uh, I don't have a webcam. They've all been panic bought. <laughs> um, nice picture though. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, listen, this is, my question is rather broad. Uh, it, it's just, I've seen some call outs in, let's say, social media arguments on ABC uh, articles about people calling out landlords um, on their investments uh, as fairly stable income in terms of rent is always the same every week. And I can understand why you would do that for the sake of rent affordability or housing affordability. Um, but it makes sense to me that we say that housing affordability is uh, something like 33% of your income. Wouldn't it be better to have rent uh, as something like proportional to your income and therefore variable in the same way that, uh, that a dividend would be to a stock? I'm just like, I know this is sort of broad. I'm just kind of wondering why the system is the way that it is. Why do we um, prioritize those kinds of investments in Australia? Very interesting. Uh, so um, you know, in Singapore, you can uh, rent from the public housing provider uh, and um, they will take a maximum of 30% of your income. Uh, and your income is generally very low or it's, it's some arbitrary number. I think it's probably 28.5 or some peculiar number that someone wrote in. And yeah, if you lose your job, you don't have any uh, income, you pay 28.5% of zero. Um, so you can get that. And historically also in, in retail and commercial, there were turnover leases where if you, you know, if you didn't sell many products, you, you know, you pay 10% of your turnover as a rent. Um, I can't recall the details, but when I was first studying to be a property value, these were relatively common, but I believe they were, they were almost banned or, or, you know, became unpopular um, in commercial and retail about 15 years ago. Um, but yeah, you, you could do that. Um, and I think these are unusual times. And so just, you know, having a short term once off crisis policy to help make things flexible, it's, it's probably getting us a long way. And I, yeah, we also want to change the story for long term keeping rents down, supplying more housing, uh, avoiding bubbles and things like that as well. Um, but yeah, you, you, you're right. Um, it is interesting how it's like that. <laughs> I hadn't put it that way before, but yeah, it's, it's a good way I might borrow that. No problem. Thank you. Um, most right, privatised uh, businesses. Uh, Stephen, shall we finish with your uh, question? Um, Tim no? Matthews was waiting a while as oh, well. We've got we might people. have time for both. Great. Yep. G'day, uh, g'day, Cameron. Really enjoyed your okay. talk. Um, like the ideas, both in the board and detail, and also the idea that crisis uh, resets people's thinking, provides opportunities for new ideas. 
Um, my question, and it is a question because I don't have an answer to it, but either yourself or others, is that if that's correct, that the crisis is throwing all sorts of new ideas um, onto the table and the government is behaving in ways that they wouldn't have thought themselves some while ago, yeah. um, my question is about this government. And right now, the government, and particularly Scott Morrison, seems to be using the crisis to do what he does best and has done throughout most of his career, which is give uh, public funds uh, unaccountably to uh, private interests he's closely associated with and very uh, sympathetic towards. Um, I would quote, and I'm not sure it's quite come out yet, but it would appear that the subsidy and support to the childcare industry was a direct result of lobbying by private ch uh, childcare providers rather than by the apparent um, policy think tank that he announced it to us. So. My question is, if that last piece of analysis is correct, how do we get these good ideas um, before a government and particularly an individual who appears to be learning um, exactly the opposite? Well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's not just a crisis problem. Um, Sorry about that, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah look, that's, that's what um, gets me up in the morning. How do we... How do we uh, how do we change the incentives so that um, you know that sort of stuff can end you up in prison rather than in a cushy board after politics? <laughs> That's the question. How do you? So there's a lot of. I mean, it's it's also a problem of getting the rules changed. There's a lot of rules that would work if you had independent authorities advise and administer the rules, but how do you get someone who doesn't want the rules to change to change the rules mm. against them? And, um, uh, and I've, you know, I've said every time I, I, I do a talk or I say it takes a crisis to change and maybe this crisis is not enough. Maybe we need a more of a, um, a political corruption crisis. Um, maybe this is distracting us too much. Uh, from corruption to actually take advantage of it in that way. Maybe we'll end up with good things in health funding, <coughs> investment in hospitals and things. Maybe that's the best outcome we can hope for from this. But on the corruption side and the, the giveaways to political mates, mm. maybe it's, it's the story or maybe the, it's not as visual or, or, or impactful as it needs to be to cut through um, so maybe this is not the crisis to, to resolve that, but, uh, yeah, in general, uh, independent, uh, journalists, investigative journalists, Michael West, you know, he's a one man band exposing things left, right and center. Um, the ABC does as best they can in light of the unwillingness of many commercial media outlets to expose their particular mates. Uh, we just keep, keep trying. And I think as long as the evidence is out there, when the right crisis comes, then at least we have all that um, background information and stories and well, did you know this also happened and this also happened? And we can amplify that crisis for that anti-corruption purpose. That's my hopeful answer. <laughs> Thank you. I think that might be a really good place to stop. Um, I would like to unmute everybody and we're going to do a round of applause for Cameron. Ready, set, go. <laughs> now I'm going to mute you all again. <laughs> um, uh, so thank you so much. I've muted Cameron as well, but um, I'll just, I'll undo that. Here we go. Um, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. We had uh, 54 people at various times online tonight that I can gather. There is a few that I don't have your actual name. Um, that you're just called your device name, but some of you have messaged and you've managed to um, put me straight on that. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just asking so that everybody gets the follow-up email, which will include the recording and the, um, the chat as a text file as well, so everybody can refer back to what we've talked about tonight. 
Um, I might stop the recording there and then we'll continue on into the second part of our meeting. But thank you again, Cameron. It's been fantastic to have you speaking. Uh, to thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's not every day you get 54 thoughtful people in a room to talk about this sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, especially being locked at home the last couple of weeks. <laughs> so, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gabrielle, for facilitating this. Thank you. Yeah, good on you, Gabe.